Good morning. It is good to see you. Good to see you at all of our campuses, whether you're at Dillsburg, the sanctuary, here in the auditorium, online. We are grateful to be together. My name is Bob. Uh, we are concluding today the first part of a sequence of series that we're doing. Uh, this has been, uh, what, 12 weeks or so that we've been spending in the very beginning of our scriptures, Genesis 1 and 2, which we would consider the creation account. And that's been really, really important. And uh, just as illustration of why it's important that this is there, um, if you ever showed up at our house, one thing you would uh, learn quickly, or if you show up in my office, you'll probably see this fairly quickly. My wife and I love to read. We love books. Um, we love to share books back and forth. It feels like every time uh, we are talking about books, she's got about six that she thinks I need to read, and I have about six that she needs to read. And therefore, you can imagine that the stacks expand. And we're often asking those questions, what are you reading, and, and those kind of things. Well, the other day, um, I was upstairs, and, and she came upstairs, and she said, hey, uh, did you get some new books to read? And I mean, that's a pretty normal yes. It doesn't matter what time she asked. Uh, yeah, probably, somewhere. And she said, I saw a stack of books downstairs. I was like, oh, OK. And she said, why are you reading those books? And it was that way that she asked it, that it wasn't, I started like running through my mind quickly of thinking about what stacks of books might be downstairs. And then I remembered, I had been gifted three books at a conference I was at. And um, one of the titles of one of the books, which I'm guessing was the book that sparked something in her, was how to not marry a jerk. <laughs> and I thought, well, I can, I can understand why she might have asked the question. <laughs> but I was, I was wondering then later, as I had a little more time to reflect on it, I thought either she was thinking I had given, I had I bought a book to give to her, which she was probably thinking, yeah, I've been waiting with this my whole life. <laughs> or maybe what she was probably thinking of, um, what, do, what is Bob thinking that I haven't been aware of? All that to say, what we believe about Genesis 1 and 2 is it lays the foundation for the rest of a story. And if you don't know the first part of the story, because she didn't know that those were just gifted to me randomly, everybody in the conference received those books without knowing who she was or who I am, uh, they were given. But without that part of the story, something else was um, thought to be the case, which created some tension. And for us, we, you may have felt like, boy, we have been in these first two chapters of Genesis for a long time. And I would admit, yeah, but we could spend a lot more time there because those first two chapters lay a foundation for what helps us to understand both who we are, who each other are, and, but most importantly, who God is and the relationship that he has invited all people to have with him. This is the key to understanding the rest of the entirety of the rest of the scriptures that we've been given in the Bible. So this morning, we're, this is Palm Sunday, and maybe this is new to you, but Palm Sunday is the, the Sunday that we celebrate in the Christian calendar of the, the remembering Jesus entering into Jerusalem the week before he dies, a death on a cross and his resurrection that happened on that, that first Sunday. And so as we think about and, and think and remember uh, what God has done through Jesus all those years ago, we start by thinking about Palm Sunday. And you think, well, why is that important? Because if we can understand Palm Sunday in light of what God originally created in Genesis 1 and 2, we are better able to understand the totality of the story that God is actually through Jesus reconciling all of the world and turning what had been broken upside down and beginning to bring healing to all of it. And to know the beginning of the story helps us to make sense of why it was that Jesus died in our place, why his sacrifice of his life 
his victorious resurrection from the dead, defeated evil, defeated uh, principalities, opened and set forth a new way of living for all those who would come to follow him, it begins to give us a greater picture of what God was doing. And so we want to make sense of that first part of Genesis in order to make sense of so much else that comes past that. But I'm caught uh, by a particular passage in Luke 19. We think about Palm Sunday, and if you've been in any kind of a tradition like I've been in, Palm Sunday is full of um, palm branches and coats and donkeys and Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna being shouted. But this passage is the passage that over the last probably two or three Easter's has grabbed my attention. Yes, the proclamation of who Jesus was as king is vital and so important, but seeing the reference of what Jesus was experiencing as he went into Jerusalem has has caused me to spend a whole lot of time imagining this scene in, in ways that I don't think I had ever experienced up until this part of my life. But here's what is recorded It says, as he approached Jerusalem, meaning Jesus, and he saw the city, he wept over it. He wept over it. And we're going to pause and come back to that in just a second. And he said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. And he goes on to say in the next couple verses that um, there will be destruction and the consequences of not following after him will lead to the natural outcome of sin and rebellion, which is ultimately what we know of as the destruction of the temple and of Jerusalem. <clears throat> Excuse me. But this, this passage, this little, little statement here of Jesus weeping over the people that he saw, my guess is all of us have had some sort of an experience like that. Somebody we knew in our life we watched them making some decisions that just brought us to tears. We knew where they were, what the decisions they were making were taking them into some places that were going to be painful. We we're watching them make some decisions that were going to totally upend their life. We we're watching them make decisions that are going to bring so much pain, not only on themselves, but on the people around them. And there's nothing that we can force them to do differently. But as we watch them, our hearts break for them. You know that feeling? You've been there. Some of us have been that person for our parents or for our friends or for someone else that knows us. And they watch us do things or say things or go places or with motivations that are, that are gross, uh, move into parts of life that as they watch us, they just knew. Oh, this is going to bring so much pain. There's going to be heartache. And it didn't have to be this way. This image of Jesus looking over Jerusalem, saying that, praying that, speaking that, feeling that, brings me back to thinking about why we spent so much time in Genesis 1 and 2, because it was in this passage, these passages, where we have said over and over and over, we started with the idea that the reason that the writers recorded Genesis 1 and 2 like they did is because the focus of the beginning of all things was a who, not a how. And from the very beginning, it has been about this picture that this creative God of all that is decided that out of this overflow of love that we we know is happening within the Trinity spills out into this creation. He speaks it into existence. And in this, the the only... um, The only thing that we have to recognize as humanity is that that there is because God decided there would be. There is because God decided there would be. And that as his creation, it is our role and our responsibility and our vocation to praise him, to thank him, to um, depend on him, to wait upon him, to live in his authority as the king to recognize him as truth, to recognize him as goodness, of faithfulness, of kindness. And that as his created order, uh, humanity was the crown jewel of his creation. You and I, for all of eternity, or since creation, all people have been this image-bearing people. 
that we have been given value, intrinsic value, because God said, as I create humanity, they are going to have a unique place in the created order. And they're going to have vocation. They're going to have purpose. They're going to have jobs to do and work to do. And they are going to bring order out of chaos, just as it says God did in the very beginning. And that the humanity was going to populate and multiply and take this um, order making capacity into all places of creation. And it's in this rhythm that we watch Genesis 1 and 2 formed to say this was the beauty and this was the hope of God's creation is that humanity would indeed be and live as his dependent creation. And what we know happens later is that our independence, our rebellion, our want for our own kingship and our own autonomy uh, creates significant brokenness. And it brings brokenness that you and I feel even yet today, but it is not the end of the story. So I want us to um, enter into one of the most important relationships that are defined at the very beginning of all of this. Because we've, we've talked about God being the who of creation. We've talked about um, the created order being given over to humanity to steward and take care of. We've talked about humanity being kings, priests, and prophets. And all three of those roles continue to be part of what we are called to be. And we're going to end this by talking about this relational uh, glue that God creates in, in how he designed men and women to live and, and how he was going to bring this picture together of what it was going to be for men and for women. And the interesting piece of this is the word that God, uh, that is recorded here of what God has given as, as Eve. And so we're going to start in Genesis 2. Uh, verse 18, this is after God has created Adam. He's then brought all the animals in front of Adam. Adam has named them all. I have no idea how long that took. I have no idea how he came up with all the names. I don't know any of the answers to all those questions, but there are good answers to all those questions, I'm sure. Um, but he gets through this, and then it says, The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And then down in verse 20, uh, the second part of verse 20, it says, but for Adam, no suitable helper was found. Now I want to pause there because this word helper is, is a really important word. And sometimes it may be that uh, we read through these, these passages, we might read our Bibles, and sometimes we don't remember that certain words are used with really intentional, no, all the words are used with really intentional meaning of why they're put together and how they're established. And so this idea that uh, we wind up here out of helper, out of Genesis 2, 18 and 20, is it's there. That's the Hebrew word that is used here. And I would just venture to guess that if I were to ask you, what does helper mean? We would come up with a bunch of different answers right here. We'd have a bunch of different pictures of what helper means. And we would have a bunch of different illustrations or thoughts about what it means for men and women to live in relationship to one another. We would have very different perspectives there. But again, because what we believe is that God is outside of us and he has established truth and, and we get to find the truth in him and truth is not established first and foremost within us to bring out of us. And why do I say that? Because the other day, my wife and daughter were watching, you know, those, um, oh, those shows where there's like music people and they sing and then there's like these people that their chairs flip around. I don't even know what it is. They were watching that show. And something that, somebody said the voice. There we go. Um, I'm not, not giving any recommendation for it whatsoever. I, it was on in the background. But there was a moment where I, they do these interviews with people and I heard this one person on there say something like, and I'll, I'll butcher this exactly, but it's something like, um, everything about who I am is inside of me and I just need to bring this out for the world to know it. And I thought, wow, that's really an interesting, interesting way to see things. It is, it is 
for us that understand God's creation of us, it is that our first responsibility is to understand who the God is that has formed us and that I take the shape of living my life from that creation. It was never intended that I get to tell God what I'm going to do or what I'm about or, or what my purposes, is, purposes are. That, that there's this place of safety and hopefulness and comfort when from the very beginning of creation, the authors of scripture recorded this understanding that all of us would take our first understanding of life from him. And that that is key to us being able to then understand the rest of life. I've been really interested in some studies and I don't have time to go into all of them right now, but a number of studies I've been reading recently that talk about some of the anxiety and the difficulty that people have in our cultural moment stems from them being told from their, the time that they are very small that it is their purpose, it is their requirement, it is their destiny to figure out who they are in life based on the stuff in them to bring it out. And, and there's some interesting uh, studies that are saying, actually, we were never created to try to bring definition and defining of our own selves to light, we were made as people to find our understanding of who we are because of who God has made us to be. And you may say, well, Bob, that just sounds like a, a difference of semantics. I don't believe it is. I believe if there is something that in the way that God created us and told us we were to live and to, uh, that, that he had purpose for us and, and vocation for us, that the more we can live into that and understanding of that, it takes the weight off of my shoulders and of your shoulders of having to put and define my life by my own stuff, but instead live in the trusting relationship of the God who has actually created me. And it changes everything. And I believe that this is from the very beginning what God has given uh, to relationship that he was forming for men and women. Because it is so hard for us to understand in our day and meeting other people and living in relationship to people to ever think that there was a time that people wouldn't be a problem. That there was ever a time when, when those around me weren't um, keeping me from something or, or that the people around me weren't to be used so that I can move my own life forward and taking advantage of them. There's something very, very different that God created from the very beginning when he said that, that it wasn't good for Adam to be alone and he didn't have a partner to experience life with. And so God was going to create someone else to walk alongside of him. And it's this helper person, this etzer. And, and this is a great definition by Sarah Fisher, who, who has a, a really cool website who deals with Hebrew words and she says, this word means an ally or a rescuer. Someone who comes running when the people cry out for help. And Etzer drops everything to save those in need. And Etzer is a hero. That seems like a really odd definition for a woman to play alongside a man, doesn't it? Is that your definition of helper? Is that where you would have landed? Because what's so fascinating is this word, this idea of helper is only used twice about a, a woman in this creation in 18 and 20, verse 18 and verse 20 of chapter two of Genesis. 16 times that word is actually used of God. Now, women don't get big heads. I'm not saying that you're gods, but, but this, this word was used as, as what God's relationship to Israel was that he was the helper. He was the one coming alongside and taking care of and working with and protecting and, and overseeing. And that, that there was a, a relationship that was dependent upon one another. And so the interesting thing that we see in, in these passages and, and several others is that etzer is a word that ultimately through scripture gets used by the helper that God comes alongside Israel. And that is helpful, helpful for us then to move backwards to make sense of what did it mean for God to create Adam 
and then his helper Eve, that they would be together in allies, that they would seek to care and walk with one another in the same way that the love of the Trinity poured over, this relationship was going to live in, in mutual submission and care for one another. The Apostle Paul, actually in, in Ephesians chapter 5, uses the same language. He says, it is important that we submit to one another. And then he goes forward to give some, some context to some scripture about marriage in the Ephesian situation. And it's this idea that flows through Scripture that the ideal of the way that men and women would see each other was that they were allies, they were for each other, they desired to see the other uh, redeemed and restored and participate in salvation and the goodness of God and the relationship with Him. That, that this combined together um, was, was of an at-sideness, not a a uh, hierarchical overness. You might say, well, that doesn't seem like the experience, though, that many of us have had. Um, and, and we might look over into Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. You may know this chapter 3 of Genesis is the chapter that begins to explain the rebellion of humanity away from God, where they separated and went their own way. They wanted to be their own king and their own authority, and so in, in verse 16 of chapter 3, um, we see at the very end of this verse, these words. Well, I'll read the whole, the whole thing. Uh, to the woman, he said, this is post-rebellion. I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. And I'm going to hold on to that passage and not like get into it right now, but... Most likely that isn't just talking about the moment that the child is coming out, that it's actually talking about the, the totality of the relational pain that happens. And it would end up being seen in almost every patriarch that we read through the rest of Genesis that the relational pain that happened in order for children to be born was full of strife and full of pain and full of competition and full of, of rejection. There's a whole bunch to that and, and we'll get to that another week. But this last part of this is your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. I have yet to walk into a home and see that framed on the wall. <laughs> it's not been there. I mean, maybe it's in your house and if so, I'd love to come see it. But I've not seen it. But the interesting question that we have to ask about this passage is, is this a determination of God or is this a consequence of rebellion? Because the difference between the ways that we would see that uh, matter in how we make sense of it. If this is a determination of God, um, we can let our minds wander. We could see where that could go. We could make uh, assumptions of what might happen if that's taken into the places that are, that are unhelpful. But I believe that the better way that we understand that passage is that God is simply stating to them, because sin has taken place, rebellion has taken place, the breaking of, of um, all things that were designed to bring peace and harmony and shalom, that has been broken. And now God is saying, you are going to experience consequences because of that brokenness. And you're going to experience things that you wish you would never have to experience. But I'm going to tell you that the relationships that I created to be at one and allies and partners and co-participants and co-carers of creation, that is a broken. And now you're going to begin to experience some really painful relational dynamics. If that is how we understand verse 16 of chapter 3 of Genesis, then what we have to remember is that it is not what God had created and started, but it is a consequence of the sin. And so what has happened then? For so many centuries, we have, we have bought the Genesis 3 picture as the norm and not the picture of brokenness. 
And so we have made excuses and we've made justifications and we've made all kinds of, of odd movements in our relational dynamics to put in competition men and women where that was never the case of what God originally created us to experience. Now there's going to be a lot of this we'll never be able to, uh, to get to today. But again, I want to remind you that in two weeks, we're going to have a Sunday where we just explore some questions that came up throughout uh, this section of the series, this, this part of the, the series. And if you have any questions that you want to give, there's a, a QR code, there's a, a thing. Sorry, Mary, I got way offline with this, but you can throw it up there. And she's going to leave this on there for 52 seconds for you to get your phones out if you need to, to to get those down. But you can ask any of those questions and we'll try to get to them. But, but here's, here's the question for us. If what we celebrate on Palm Sunday is a celebration of God's redemptive work in all the world through Jesus, then what is the picture that we are invited to begin to live into? It isn't Genesis 3, I would contend, but it's Genesis 1 and 2. I believe that because Jesus, death and resurrection, this reformatting and reformulating all that was broken and making it make sense and bringing it to life, God is in the process of restoring all of creation into what it originally was and it's heading toward a destiny where all things will be made new. And that in spite of the brokenness you and I experience today, God is in the work. And he is invited to partner with you and with me to bring about the wholeness to the order, the, dis, the chaos and the disorder that is around us so that he would be glorified. So that you and I can live in relationship with him, proclaiming and trusting that who he says he is, is enough. And that my life and your life would be lived looking to him as our source of truth and hope, identity, purpose, vocation, and that our lives then are brought as sacrifices to his so that when he comes again, when he returns, there will be faithful people, there will be a remnant of people who are faithfully living out the call of God that took place at the very beginning where we stated that we are looking to God to be our whole, our whole king, to make sense of our entirety of our lives, the one who brings meaning to us, who gives us purpose and, and focus. That when, we, when Jesus returns that day, whenever that is, there would be a sense that we would hear and see from Jesus that we are doing the, the life that he asked us to do from the very beginning of trusting deeply in him. I want to just end with uh, some reminders, some, some things that will call us to think about Christ's death and resurrection in light of the beginning of Genesis 1 and 2, and the conclusion of all of history where God makes everything right again through Jesus. And next week we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. But I want us to pause and think with, with this illustration of the way that God created men and women together. He formed them as allies and as partners. As one example of how God is redeeming and restoring all things. That he is calling us to ask ourselves some questions about the very resurrection of Jesus that gives life uh, more directive. It gives us a better sense of what it means to live faithfully in that relationship. The first reality is that it defeated death. It, that, that Jesus' death on the cross, for all that we're looking on, thought that was the end of the story. But what we know is his resurrection from the dead declared that death does not have the final say. Death, where is your sting? Where is your victory? But instead, the reality of life that moves beyond death into the life after death is the hope that you and I get to live in today that the very thing that Jesus experienced of resurrection from the dead will be ours at one point as well that we will die from this, this world, this physical life we have, and we will be resurrected with a heavenly body 
and are renewed and perfectly made. There is a disempowered sin that happens because of the death and resurrection of Jesus that you are no longer bound to follow the sin of life. There is nothing now that holds us tight and fast and will not be released from the power of bondage that comes through our own rebellion. But instead, Jesus has invited us to experience life, wholeness, resurrected life in him. That there is a pronouncement of victory over evil, that those powers and principalities that claimed victory as Jesus died on the cross were only to be so very disappointed to see him raised to life and realize that their time had come. And that there is no victory for the principalities and powers of evil, but only punishment. And that it initiated a healing and a shalom in all the world, in all relationships, in all vocation, in all places, that the resurrection of Jesus initiated a day for you and for me to live as if it were Eden again. Trusting completely depending fully on the presence of God in our lives and inviting us to be people of bringing order out of chaos so that shalom might be restored, that the fabric of life might be formed again in the tapestry of how we understand each other and the systems around us might reflect the beauty of the resurrected Messiah. And lastly, that there is an empowered participation that, that we are no longer living with our own sense of power, but we have been given the Holy Spirit, the very presence of God, that the life that you live and the life that I live, we are being invited to depend on the full trust and full participation with God to see our lives formed so that shalom, beauty, resurrection might be present in the life that we live. I want to ask us two questions before we go. Two questions that, that ask us to use as the illustration this, this thinking of how we see one another and the power that God created in the help, helping, helper. Helpiness wasn't a good word. The, the helping of life together in relationship to him that helps us to think about the life that we're currently living. Is it a life that reflects more the hope of Genesis 1 and 2 and the resurrected Messiah? Or is it living in the Genesis 3 story of pain and anguish and rebellion? Because I know that at times of my life, I've chosen to live in the rebellion much more than the victory. And so this morning, we ask this question, where is it that I need to claim the victory of Jesus over sin and death in my life and in my relationships? Where is it that as I live my life day after day after day, I look around and I realize I am living a Genesis 3 story of brokenness, of power over, of pride, of contempt, of jealousy, of anger. Where is it that I'm okay to allow that to continue to reside in me? And where is it that God is inviting me through Jesus to confess and give my life over to living in the power of the resurrection of Jesus? Where Eden looks a whole lot more like Genesis 1 and 2 than it does in Genesis 3 when the exile begins. Where is it that God might be inviting you to consider that where you currently are does not have to remain the place you stay, but there is a life that he has for you of redemption, of forgiveness, of hope, and of transformation. And the second one is this, if, if there is something like that, what do I need to confess and turn from in order to live in this new way of being? The image of Jesus Looking out over Jerusalem is an image that I wonder of what it is for God to look upon us today and say, oh, creation, I've invited you to experience life through my power, through my presence, through dependence upon me, 
through definition of, of who you are and what you are, and you continue to look in other places. You continue to go in other ways. You continue to fight against me and rebel against me, and the heart of God breaks. But I wonder, I wonder what happens when a community of people like ours, a community replicated millions of times across this globe, people who are, are trying the best they know how to follow after Jesus and learn to live out of the power of his spirit, what happens when we confess those moments, confess those loyalties, confess those priorities that, that have held us bondage, held us in, in bondage to a Genesis 3 kind of life. And we are looking ahead to Easter where the resurrected Messiah will proclaim upon every one of us that we are free. We have been given life. We are no longer held in the presence of and power of sin, but we have been given new life and we are a new creation. So we're going to sing a song and then in all of our campuses, there'll be opportunity following uh, the closing of those songs for us to respond through prayer, uh, prayer teams. You can sit where you are, whatever it might be. But I would just say there are moments in time where God invites us to consider how he originally created things. So we know the first part of the story. And that the more we know the first part of the story, the better able we are to live out faithfully the part of the story we're currently in. So Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for the redemption that you have begun in all of our hearts and all of our lives. We thank you that, that though we see Genesis 1 and 2 as this picture of, of created order and, and focus, we know the pain of Genesis 3 and the the rebellion of humanity from the God who created us. But we hold tight to the resurrection of Jesus who has created new meaning and restoration, who has initiated a new shalom, a new weaving of life together as it should be. And for all of us, both in our individual lives, but in our corporate lives as well, we ask God for you to convict us of places where we are not living in the, the resurrection of Jesus yet. And remind us of the spirit who is with us that we might live in the power, the glory, and the faithfulness of our King who gives us life. It's in your name we ask this because we believe in your power and in your resurrection. Amen.